Emily, thanks so much for taking the time. Um, such an interesting topic, Playland, talking about Boston's oldest and most notorious gay bar, Playland Cafe, and really the its tenacity over the years and being able to kind of weather the storms and every storm that hit it to, to become such a staple. How did this project come to be? Well, Jordan West, our amazing writer and director, I believe that they were in the depths of the Boston Library and kept coming across photos of this cafe and news clippings. Oh, wow. And it really inspired them to take a deeper look into this cafe. It's no longer there. It's currently a parking lot. I think it was demolished in 1998. Uh, but in the midst of all of that archival research, they really just became inspired. And upon that, and there really weren't very many photographs because nobody wanted to be seen there. So they were able to use certain news clippings and radio recordings that you hear in the film, but they really just built an incredible world and the costumes are spectacular and I believe they shot it in 2022 and uh, all in a soundstage. All of those sets were built uh, and it was pretty incredible. And it's very theatrical. It's a very different type of documentary film. It's very inventive, kind of hybrid and utilizes the archival footage with almost performance-like presentation and title cards and such. It's very unique. Was that always part of the intent of this project? You know, once the topic was decided upon or you knew that this was going to be something that was being made? Yeah, I think Jordan doesn't do anything ordinary. <laughs> and it really is an interesting way to tell a story. It jumps between two different timelines. We're in 1943, 1965, and 1977. And we get to follow these characters, kind of the ghosts of, of Playland's past. And I think it's such an interesting way to tell a story in a, in a kind of non-linear fashion, but to really show the characters that were there and what it must have been like. And you feel so immersed as if you were there yourself, rather it feeling like something that's a little outdated or something that's hard to resonate with. I feel like anyone, whether they're a part of the LGBTQ community or not, can feel like they've been there and that they would, they would feel at home there. Yeah, and you definitely meet a, a large cast of characters, so to speak, whether it's, you know, Lady Bunny, the dry queen, or uh, a bartender, or the owner. And, you know, of, of course, it's all presented in such that unique way that we were referencing. But again, what stood out to me was how this this location from, I believe it was 1937, this, this place just kept going. And it was such a vibrant, important piece of, of Boston uh, and of the LGBTQ community. I'm wondering, you know, what stands out to you from your involvement in this? Is there anything that you feel like you walk away with a different view of or something of that sort? I think what I walked away with is just important these spaces are to a community and how they should be preserved and they should be protected and how significant they can be to someone who's coming out or doesn't feel like they belong and can find their chosen family in a space like this. Were there any challenges in telling this story? I mean, it sounds like there was a lot of archival, well, not a lot of archival photogra uh, photographs and video and such. So you hear a lot of the audio during the film. Uh, and of course, we, we see some individuals who were involved over the years. But what were the difficulties in sort of piecing this long history together? I mean, I think, honestly, the biggest difficulties were just filming in COVID. Yeah. Uh, and uh, making sure that we followed all of those protocols and... I think that recreating such incredible sets, a million things go wrong. <laughs> and uh, it's funny, I got to see some of the behind the scenes footage when they brought in the horse, there's a scene with a horse. Um, but I think it was really just making sure that all those different timelines still felt like they existed within the same world and that it all felt cohesive, so. The fact that that was a recreated location is just fascinating to me. I mean, um, the art department absolutely killed it. Because I didn't even realize until about halfway through thinking, oh, this isn't around anymore. <laughs> so No, it hasn't been around in, gosh, almost 30 years. Wow. And uh, yeah, sadly, like I said, it's now a parking lot. So many times that happens. There's, you know, I'm right outside of Philadelphia and there's a number of LGBTQ places that have closed and have either been demolished or there's one I'm thinking of local to me that is now a parking lot as well. Um, so it's sad when these pieces of history really disappear when they meant so much to to people that, you know, frequented. Um, why do you think this is an important film? You know, we're, we're getting the North, premiere, North American premiere at Tribeca. Why is this an important film at this time? Well, I feel like LGBTQ rights are currently really being challenged. 
And I think it's important to show this piece of history. I think it's important to have this piece of history on film so it doesn't get forgotten and doesn't only exist currently as a parking lot. I think it needs to live beyond that. I think it's important to show the world again how important these spaces are and how important community is and to expose people who aren't a part of the LGBT community to that community and understand that it's a place for everybody and that safe spaces are really so significant when it comes to our society. I couldn't agree more. Emily, you're executive producer on this project, but you wear so many hats throughout your career or have worn throughout your career, actor, writer, producer. What's next for you? Oh, well, next weekend I'm shooting a short film that I wrote and directed. <laughs> Well, I wrote it. I'm not directing it. I had planned to direct it, but actually Jim Cummings, who's an amazing filmmaker that I love, is directing it. Um, and it's called Pretty Sad. And it'll be the first time I've really written something that somebody else has directed. So it's a great leap of surrendering control. Um, but that'll be entirely in black and white, explores themes of domestic violence and women's rights and women's roles. Set in 1967, a little Hitchcockian, a little Mank by David Fincher. Um, and then I'm currently developing a TV show called 13 Stepping. So we're in the midst of wrapping up the pilot. And Very it good. Hey. You seem to like to keep busy, Emily. There's always something. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. thank, you. thank you for taking the time today. I definitely appreciate it. Uh, and wish you the best. Are you traveling to Tribeca for the North American premiere? I am, yeah. I leave in the morning. Excellent. Have a great time. And thanks again thank for you. Uh, you know being a thank part. Thank you so much for watching it. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. Bye.